Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day. Welcome to our video blog here at California Realty Training. Today we have a great guest. You don't want to miss this one. We have Mr. Richard Shulman himself back again, but today he'll be shedding some light on some fantastic stuff. One of the best agents in the country. You can't miss this one. I started before real estate, I did venture capital for a minute and I thought that was my path. So I started with a numbers background, okay. which by the way, no matter whether you do residential or commercial, you need to have that like knowledge and training. Um, I started off in residential, but I was, uh, I was you know, kind of working, partnering with an apartment broker. And I actually joined for a few months a commercial, like a pure commercial firm, and I didn't love it. But we, we realized this is that I don't, I don't think that to give your clients the best that you should be one or the other. I think a lot of your clients want to buy investment property and I think you need to be able to be a resource to them. If not, then you have to refer that business out. Mm -hmm. And we know in the real estate business that the client acquisition cost is the, is the hardest part. And so if I have a client, let's say I'm your, I'm your agent, you're my client, I've sold you a house, you're happy with me. I've sold you a second house, you're still happy with me, you're referring to your friends, you say I want to buy something for investment, you need to have that too. So I think, as, I think a good agent should have a breadth of knowledge to know what's, what they can't help with. Now you say, Richard, I want to buy uh, industrial property. I, I don't know anything about that, but I can refer you to the right person. Mm -hmm. But you at least need to have a sense of these things so you can help your clients. We have to be, and it's on my website, it's our description, like we're a total real estate solution. If you're just a solution to help your client find a condo in Santa Monica, that's great for that niche, but that's not really good for a, a wide business that you need to have. So you, don't, so you don't have a niche then, you do a lot of different things. You play shortstop, third base, and second. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I thought it was a really good analogy. I don't know if you knew what the answer was gonna be, but I thought, huh? well, there's, there's a great analogy. I have no idea what the answer We're really good at, at let's say, f we're really good at first base. Let's say that's just residential, okay. norm, normal residential buy and sell. Got it. But we're also really, really good at playing shortstop, which is investments, and we know we're no good in the outfield, so we know the right people to send you to. Funny, because most people, when they get involved in real estate, yeah. they're, they're told, pick one or the other. Be a master at one of them, not a jack of all trades. And yeah. you seem to do the, uh, the opposite. Yeah, and l listen, I'm gonna tell you, it's a challenge because I think if you're new in real estate and you started, by the time you learn about real estate and the economy and finance and about the areas, because LA is, a, even if you're from LA, it's an extraordinarily diverse city of like, you know, Venice is a totally different neighborhood than North Santa Monica, which is three miles away. Right. By the time you learn all that, and then all, by, by the way, you have to learn how to do sales, you have to learn all of the technology platforms, and you have to build a pipeline of business. I mean, we're talking about one to two years for like a really sharp person. You want to layer in, well now, you know, investment real estate, you know, it's a lot to, it's a lot to handle. Would you agree that it's a whole different language, a whole different beast? Oh yeah, it's really? completely different. Which one would you recommend somebody who's brand new to start with? I mean, I think, you know, the easiest one to get into is just your pure residential because, you know, when I talk to agents, you know, who's going to hire you, right? your friends and family. Like my first deal was an up call, but my second deal was my friend. And most of my first deals were friends and family. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who hire you when they really should hire someone more experienced, right? I kind of make that joke when I teach people and say, I lose business as a producing agent. I lose business to the underqualified friend of the client, right? And right. so that's the easiest entry point. But, you know, if you want to differentiate yourself, how many realtors work in LA, 20,000? I don't know, I'm guessing, uh -huh. like a huge number. You want to differentiate yourself, you need to have an angle, you need to be able to do something better and different. Otherwise, you're just you know, one of 400 in this office and 400 in the next office, and you know, all of a sudden there's 50 offices in West LA. Let's talk about your angle then, you just yeah. mentioned angle. Yeah. But way back when you first started, you said your yeah. first few deals, I'm guessing, were to your SOI, Sphere of Influence. Yeah. What angle did you take? How did you get clients? Well, I was a really bad new agent. So like one of the things I like to teach people is how to not be a bad new agent. Uh -huh. You know, I, uh, I didn't close a deal for nine months. Oh. And uh, I worked, I mean, I, w I showed up, I worked, I had no training at my old office. There was no like, hey, do this. I did an open house every weekend. As a 23 year old guy, I was invited to a party at the Playboy Mansion twice and turned it down to do open houses, which was stupid. Wow. I was hustling, I was <laughs> out there hustling and I couldn't close anything, I had no training, no guidance. And we used to have up calls. You remember up calls? Yeah, yeah. So up calls like where they have the, the main office number on the sign and someone calls in. And one day someone calls in, can you show me this house? I'll be right there. Okay, we'll buy it. I was the first one, uh -huh. just like that. So that's like sort of like 
just show up and you might actually sell some houses. Right. But every, most of the next deals were either up calls, because I was doing a ton of that, and sphere of influence. My second deal was a four unit apartment building to a friend of mine. What? Yeah. Wow. So maybe that's where you got involved, well, you got interested in the commercial yeah. part, right? Well, yeah, and then their family was doing real estate, so I learned from them, and I learned, you know, like, this is a good thing to do. Like, you know, they were making, as a family, good money, not from their main jobs, but, I mean, they were from their main jobs, but really from the rental side. Uh -huh. And that really influenced my thinking about, you know, A, I should be selling this, and B, a lot of realtors are not buying this, why not? Because this is really like why we earn real estate is uh -huh. to to buy a property, right? To have insight and access to the best investment. Right. Let's talk about your uh, your skill set when it comes to maintaining clients. Yeah. What do you do about that? Or how do you do that? So I would tell you, like in a half joking way, I think it's the only thing I'm really good at. Like I'm not like one of these guys who's uh, like learned every script, and I'm not a hard closer. I'm not going to go in there and joust with you on a commission close on a listing appointment. Uh -huh. I think what I'm doing, I'm like, I'm ferocious about meeting someone, absorbing their information. So I meet you as a potential client, I get your, all your information into my database, and then I'm going to follow up you forever. Like, forever. But what does that mean, follow up? That's what I'm trying to get at. What does that mean? So what do you do to follow it's up? It's really broad, right? right. And in, in a sense, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the client, it depends on the value of the client, right? So like, for example, I have a friend who's an attorney, and we're friends, we actually are personal friends, and he also sends me a lot of business, and I send him a lot of business. So we have lunch probably, I would say, once a month, once every other month. Um, I have some clients who I sold a pro I just closed a uh, property I sold to him 11 and a half years ago, and I haven't seen him since then, but I've called and emailed once a quarter just to say hi. I know that he doesn't want to hang out. He doesn't want to go to lunch with me. He's out of town a lot. He just wants me to update him on the market and such. And when he was ready to sell, I was front and center. So it's a spectrum, right? It's hey, I'm available for you, let me stay front and center. And also, like, you're really valuable to me as a friend and a conduit of business, let's hang out all the time. The other thing I do, if you looked at my calendar, like, I'm going to lunch with a you know, new potential client after this, I'm going on social coffee dates, social lunch dates, social engagement activities, constantly. Like, I just volunteered at my kid's school, I did drop off at my kid's school earlier, I've got a coffee date, you know, I'm doing, I've got a lunch after this, I'm doing two or three a day of like out in the world meeting people. Because going back to that first closing, it's like just be out there in the world and meet people, build these relationships, you'll do business with them. What are these dates like? What do you do on these dates, on these business dates? Well, it, again, it depends. I mean, a lot of it's just sort of like maintenance, like keeping up with people and being, you know, just being front and center and a value. I'm not a salesperson, right? So I'm not going out there and saying, hey, you want to buy a house? Hey, you should buy a property. Hey, sell your house. It's like, hey, what's going on with you? How's your wife? How are your kids? You know, what's new with the Dodgers, right? Like that type of conversation. And if real estate comes up, which it always does, right? Mm -hmm. Because they know what I do. And I mean, do you know anyone not interested in real estate? Yeah, no. I mean, it's the easiest thing to talk about. Yeah, I used to hate going to barbecues because you get all these questions on real estate. Yeah. You just want to relax. I got you. So my, dad, my dad's an attorney and everyone likes to ask him for free uh, legal advice at parties. So he'll just hide in the corner. Yeah. Or he taught me as a kid to sort of like block people from him. <laughs> So it's sort of the same thing. It's right. like sometimes I go to a party and I'm like, ah, geez, I just don't want to talk about real estate anymore. I got you. Yeah. But it's like it's not hard, right? Everyone's always still like, what do I talk about? It's like, just tell them you're in real estate and they'll want to talk to you. You better have something to say. Right. So we just go out and just we're just friends. Because ultimately what Gary Keller says is people work with people they like. Now it helps if you're skilled and you're better than other people and you have a track record, but the baseline of getting hired in this business is they need to trust you. It's an emotional business before anything else. On that point, let me go yeah. into the likability factor. You think that's yeah. important? Oh, 100 percent. Really? Yeah. So you think your skill set is just the minimal? Likability is all that you finish. Likability is. So I don't. I don't want to say like you. If you're super likable, that you don't need any other skill. But you know, like if you were extremely likable, it makes everything else easier. Okay. That's if fair. you're not very likable, be realistic about that. That's okay. Your skills better be fantastic. That's fair. But I've, I would say, like, when I say, like, who do I lose business to, it's the, uh, it's, when I say it's the underqualified friend of the client, it's sort of a joke. It's, it's someone that they have a better personal relationship with. And when they have to sit down and decide, do we hire Richard or do we hire, you know, our friend's kid or, you know, our, my boss's, you know, wife or whatever that relationship is, uh -huh. they have to say, like, ultimately, who do I want? I heard this from a friend of mine in Ohio. He said, you have to build a relationship so that they give you the keys and the alarm code to the house that their children sleep in at night. Wow. 
And ultimately, is it, is it me, Richard, or is it like someone we kind of know? And like as humans, like our natural instinct is to sort of like want to work with people we trust. You want to give me the keys and the alarm code to the house where your kids sleep in? Like me or someone you know really well? Like be, be, the, be the friend that's going to get you business very, very easily. Sounds like you're taking this job then personally. Oh, I mean, what's, what's more personal than, than the home? That's what I'm saying. Most yeah. people take it you know, as a business venture. They think it's all business, but you take it one step further. You go. I mean, you can't, you can't dissociate the fact that this is a business, okay. and we're talking about enormous amounts of money. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm always surprised when I hear people say things like, you know, I need the most money for my home. And then it's like, well, can we, be, can we have an open house Sunday? It's like, well, I don't want strangers in my house. <laughs> It's like, okay, that's fine, you choose, but what's more important, I know that getting an extra open house will probably make your house worth more money. I don't want more people in my house. Okay. You know, I don't want to show it anymore, just take this offer, right? Like, we know that as much as people say, this is a business, I want the most money, at the same time, it's like, it's the house where their kids sleep. Right. Right, it's where all their stuff is, it's very personal. So you have to really be good at balancing both. And look, some people are savages and want every penny out of it, and some people, I don't know what the opposite of a savage is, but some people are super interpersonal about their home. And I've seen people take huge cuts on the value of their home because they got a good offer and they don't want to show it anymore, right? Or they're tired of cleaning up the house every day. Right. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's, you know, you have to make those decisions. But as an agent, our job is to be really flexible and work with the person who will, you know, demand that you have an open house Thursday afternoon in case one person shows up to the person who's like, I'm going to show this house one time and that's it. Have you ever, speaking of that, have you ever uh, turned away a client? Um, yeah, not a lot. I mean, you know, a funny thing people talk about when, when new agents or especially newer agents, oh, this is so difficult. These clients are so difficult. And it's like, if this was easy, like, you wouldn't get paid to do it. Or, like, it would be a different business. Like, part of our job is taking on difficult people. So um, we don't like to turn away business. Um, I don't mind it, you know, quote, difficult client because I appreciate that we're earning a you know, good amount of money for doing a really complex service. But I think what you need to have is, I think when you turn on a client, it's not because you think, oh, this person's really difficult. It's like, am I, is this person going to be economically viable for me? That being like, someone comes in and says, I want the greatest deal ever and I can only see properties Tuesday at 11 a.m. Like that type of like, you know, obviously it's sort of a rational scenario, but okay. you work with those people who are like, these are my parameters, you know. I need a pool house on the beach for a million dollars. Like, well, okay, I know that I can't find what you're looking for. And I need to be honest with you about that. And like, that's the kind of clients that we uh, will at least attempt to re-educate about what's possible. And if they're stuck on that, then we really can't help them. Because here's the thing, we don't want to turn people down, but at the same time, if I spend time working with a client who's not viable, I'm taking time away from my clients who are, and that's not fair to them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. Taking it, then you have several clients. Um, well, you have to balance, right? So like, you have, it's good that you do a lot of business because one of the things clients hire me for is I'm seeing a lot of transaction volume. And so I have a better sense of the market than an agent doing five deals a year because I'm seeing 10 times that, 20 times that, whatever. <laughs> If you don't have a good sense of the market, you're not adding as much value. At the same time, if you have so much sense of the market that you can't focus on your clients, you're also doing the wrong thing. So you've got to find that balance. So how do you find the balance? Um, I think doing it long enough, you just sort of have a sense of, of what's, what the load is that you could handle. I mean, the nice part about having a team is that I can say, you know, you come to me and say, Richard, we want to buy this, this, and this. I say, great. You know what? You need to talk to this person on my team. They're the right person for you. Because I'm not going to say I'm too busy for you. That's not going to come off well. But you know, I need to find a good, a good match for you, and I need to keep my time balanced. It's hard, right? You do this long enough, you get people show up out of the woodwork left and right to buy and sell homes, but you have to have, like, just some planning for that. Right. Yeah. Now, this is a perfect segue to what I wanted to ask you next. It went from Richard Shulman's, you know, real estate world to a team. You keep saying, yeah. we, we, we. We don't yeah. like to turn anybody away at the team. Yeah. When did you decide a team is good for you? Huh. So I did everything backwards because like, I remember I started before we, you know, there was no training videos when I started. Right. You know, they weren't doing this right. uh, 12 years ago. You know, there was like some audio recordings and such. Um, it sort of started. It's a funny story, actually. Actually, we should have planned this. We couldn't have planned this better. Um, a guy calls me. This is 2009. So we're at the bottom of the foreclosure, top or the bottom of the foreclosure market, depending on how you look at remember it. Remember that, yeah. Um, and this guy called me, and he's just one of those guys. He's like. I want to buy a foreclosed house for half the asking price, but I'm paying cash. And it's like, dude, I have a hundred people who want to do that, but they'll pay more than you. I can't help you. 
he called the broker of ISO. I really just didn't call him back. I'm like, I just can't help you. Like, you want to tell me you want to pay 95%? I mean, the banks don't sell things for 50% discounts. They're already, in 2009, they're already losing 50%. Right. And he called the broker of the office and said, Richard's not calling me back. I have no idea why this guy was so stuck on me. So I go to the team meeting, and I was the number one agent in the office that time. And so I was known commodity. On your own. You're number one on Solo, your own. Solo, yeah. Got it. I was a known commodity, and there's 50 people in the meeting. And I went to the meeting, and I said, listen, I need help showing. Because the broker had called me and said, this guy is calling me complaining. And I remember she told me, she said, I, I said something like, what do you want me to do? And she's like, I don't care what you do, but he will, like the way she said it, I remember, he will never call me again. Do you understand? I'm like, yep, I got it. So I went to the team meeting, and I said, listen, I'm busy. I need someone to help me show property this weekend. Because I want to get this guy off my plate, but I didn't have to, I mean, I was packed. 2009, you're busy in real estate. Yeah. So this guy, Peter, stands up and says, I'll do it. Peter shows the guy property on a Saturday, and he calls me Saturday, and he says, uh, we opened escrow on this property. And I'm like, you're, you're so dumb, Peter. Like, you knew agent, you don't know anything. You didn't open escrow. Did you write an offer? Did you show, like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I think we opened escrow. I'm like, well, show me the paperwork. So he comes in, this guy, Peter, signed I opened escrow for like a million to all cash closing in 15 days what? on one showing. Yeah. He did on the proper paperwork? Everything was Our fine. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah. So that was your team? Your, the that was it. Peter and I, uh, you know, that was August 09. You know, Peter worked with me for like six years. He moved to Indianapolis. He sold 200, 250 homes. He'll probably watch this video and like comment on it. <laughs> but he's a successful broker there now. But so that was being the team. And it's like, oh, you can do, you know, more together right and then we got an assistant and then we got another assistant and then we added another agent another agent and then it's sort of you know but what you adding these agents what do you look for in these agents you know we just we change our mind all the time i think our ideal agent is someone with a little bit of experience now peter had closed a few transactions beforehand uh -huh. so, and he was also coming from a professional career so like those things are great like pre professional previously in a professional career like if you're working retail before, and I need to teach you how to like write an email properly, I mean, it's, it's like an extra, an extra hill to climb. Like what's the success rate for agents? It's not tremendous, right? right? So if I have to add in every layer of difficulty I have to add in, it's harder. People I've brought in with previous professional careers tend to do much better because they already know how to write an email. They already know how to speak to someone as a professional. Um, I brought a guy in as a commodities trader and within six months he was like destroying it. He was just killing it. He mean, he'd been 15 years in the professional business in sales, in, in numbers. Um, so, so that's great. I think the bottom line, what you need from people, if you want to succeed in real estate, this is the worst. People say, I want to be in real estate because it's flexible. It is flexible when you have a big business and you can afford to get away. Uh, like I said, the first couple years was not flexible. Um, you need to work. This is a volume of business. Like you have, to, you have to go out there and work 50, 60, 70 hours a week your first couple years. And you need to be okay making phone calls. The people who work 35 hours and won't pick up the phone will not succeed. You better have a rich family right. with doing a lot of real estate through you if well, you want to do that. Well, these people who are, let's say, uh, I don't know, nervous about the business, yeah. weren't too sure about the first year, would it be a good idea for them to join the team? I mean, how is the team beneficial yeah. to somebody who's brand new? I think the team does a lot of things. And the team's not right for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, the commodities trader went on his own. He wasn't really, you know, set for a team. That's fine. I mean, we're still friends and I wish him the best. It's not, it's not a, you know, that's not a problem. Um, I think team is great, especially in LA. You need to have a database. I'm from LA. My family's from LA. I know a lot of people here. I have a built-in database. If you just moved here two, three, five, eight, ten years ago, it's going to be really hard for you to like have a database of people buying homes, right? Um, team's great to give you leads right away, give you access to leads, give you open houses to sit. Um, when you're on my team or another good team, well, there's not a lot, so be careful. When you're on a good team and you can go into a meeting and say, I'm part of the X team and we're doing a ton of business or the number one in this market or number one in that market or whatever, it's good. When, you know, when you're an agent on my team and you can say, I'm, one of, I'm part of one of the top teams at Keller Williams Realty, that gives you instant credibility whether you've done anything or not because we're backing you. you know, we have our back-end systems. Right. We have a huge admin department and so I don't need you to learn every intricacy of everything because we have people doing that for you. I need you to pick up the phone, show property, make relationships. You're going to learn everything eventually, but it's not going to be an impediment to you making sales. You're not going to have to stop your world to go figure out an escrow problem. We have people who do that, who have done it for years on thousands of files. Um, a team will short circuit the path to success for people, but it's still not going to get you away from the fact that you need to work 
50, 60, 70 hours a week, and you need to pick up the phone. And, and honestly, if you're not going to do those two things, it's not, I mean, it's just, it's not going to work. You still looking for new team members? Always. Really? You want to join? I had no idea. Yeah. I thought you were limited. No, I had no, no idea. Well, I, we always have openings. We always have openings for quality people. If you have a KPA, I have, look at it. I can definitely refer some people who would be yeah. anxious to join a solid team. You're as solid as they come. Yeah. I, I had no idea. We, have, uh, we never have uh, too many agents because people decide after two years they don't love it. People come in and out, and we always need more. Would you consider yourself a patient, a patient leader that would be one to help somebody who comes onto your team? Uh, I'm patient in some ways, but I have people who are patient trainers. Would you show somebody who, <laughs> oh, good, all right. <laughs> so we have a, that answers that question. We have a CEO who does the training for new agents. We have a, a, our own internal coach trainer who does a few hours a week of training. We have all of our training on video. And, and this all under the Richard Schulman team. Yeah, we have no all idea. of our own internal stuff. So no you join, idea. we have our internal training layered in conjunction with KW. I'm glad you're mentioning this. I had no idea. Yeah, and then I do some stuff too. I thought you actually sat here with somebody and said, this is how you do an RPA. Like, oh, definitely not, no. <laughs> we actually have an, an organized system in play. Well, we have for the RPA, for example, we have two videos that will teach you how to do an RPA, but you're not going to be writing them. Like, we'll train you how to write them, but we have staff write them. Uh -huh. I mean, like, you may write them at some point, but I'd rather just have the staff do it for now. Okay. I need you making phone calls and going on appointments to yeah. start with. You know, by the time you're, ma if you make it 6, 12, 18 months in, you're going to know how to do an RPA just by seeing them. But day one, I need you on the phone. I don't need you learning, you know what an INA report is. Can a new team member make a living being on the phone? I mean, it's the only way to do it, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Meaning on the team? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. We have, uh, we have people, yeah, our new agents do well. If they, if they do the right things, our new agents are doing, I would say a good new agent first 12 months is about six to eight million. Um, I would say second year we tend to see about eight to twelve million. Usually you see that big jump in year two and then also in year three. Well, let's get specific there, let's get, let's get clear. You mean in sales? Yes, yeah. Okay, that's not, that's not what they're going to earn. I mean, if they make making well, a phone call. You know, okay. <laughs> right. but, I mean, I don't want people looking thinking, oh, wow, I can make $8 million take home with the rich, Rick Richard. Yeah, that'd be great. It hasn't yeah. happened yet. <laughs> what was the most difficult time for you in real estate? The hardest was just starting. I just didn't know what I was doing, and I wasn't making sales. And, I mean, I was fortunate I lived at home. You know, I didn't have any pressing financial concerns. But, uh, you know, I was pretty close, I think, to quitting. I mean, fortunately, when I made that first sale, I actually became Rookie of the Year at my old firm. Because when I hit that first sale, everything started falling into all those dominoes started getting knocked down. Uh -huh. I think I made like six or seven sales the next few months. But I was pretty close to quitting. Let's talk about that. This is, that's important. Yeah. Why, what made you not quit? I think, uh, I, I don't remember like really like you know? getting that close to it. I think it was like in the back of my head, like if this doesn't start working out soon, I got to figure something out. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, fine. You know, the sales fortunately came. It wasn't like I made a sale. It was like I made a sale, and then literally the next week I made a sale, and then a couple more. So I, I made six or seven pretty quickly that first end of the first year, uh -huh. and then I was like, okay, this is working out. Um, but that was the hardest time. I mean, look in a market shift um, as a broker of property, it's it's good for your business. I mean, we don't wish shift on the consumer, of course, but. In a market shift, when you're skills-based, your market share expands. I sold like maybe nine homes in 2006. I sold about 30 in 2007, and like 50 in 2008, something like that. That's, am that's amazing for that back then. Well, you should. That's what you should be doing. You know, the market changes. The weak agents leave the market. Right. And the strong agents absorb market share. Because if you look at the numbers, the number of realtors dropped by like probably almost half in 2007 to 10 or so. Right. But the number of sales only went down by about 15%. Right. I mean, it wasn't down. It wasn't really. I mean, and I'll agree with you. Those were those were my best years, also. Yeah. It was during the downturn, I did most of my business then too. The first time anyone ever asked me why they should why they should hire me as the realtor was in 2008. I remember it happening. I've been in real estate like four years at this point. I mean, it was a while. I mean, you know, at, when the market is turbulent, people stop hiring their wife's boss's wife to sell the house. That was maybe a little bit of a long chain. I got you. They stop hiring the friend and they start saying, I want to hire my friend, but I'm really nervous about selling my house or I really want to get a great deal in this marketplace. I need a pro. And so at that point I was like, well, I mean, I'm, I'm selling a lot of property. Uh -huh. I can do that for you. And they start hiring me. Then it gets easy. You know, business begets business. So you've you been pretty it. consistent for the last 13 years? Yeah. Really? Yeah. We've had one, one year we were down 3%. 
We've been up every other year except for that. Wow. Yeah. Hence all these awards. Listen, how about, yeah. um, let's talk about the typical glitz and glamour of a successful real estate agent. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, somebody gets successful. Yeah. They start to, I don't know, uh, change their attitude. Yeah. They become high maintenance. They become <laughs> glitz and glamour, if you know what I mean. Are you referring to me? No, no, no. I think what we do is important, but at the end of the day, we're also, you know, we're real estate, bro. We're not doctors, you know. Uh -huh. We're not teachers. Like, I don't, you know, I don't think it, I don't, it's just not how, okay. how we do things. I don't know how to answer that. Like, I don't, gotcha. I don't think that, uh, you know, you're not going to see me on TV driving a, a Rolls Royce ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't own a Rolls Royce, and I'm probably not like, camera ready for a TV show, but it's just not really <laughs> right. a thing. Right. It's just an important question. I guess the question yeah. would be, is it important to, to, to stay humble? Is humility important? Yeah, of course. I mean, for, any, for anything. I think more than that, I think it's just like, if we're friends and you're like, Richard, you're my realtor and I'm going to do business and I'm going to refer you, and then I change, we're not friends anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go to your friend's, you know, $500,000 property with a $3,000 suit on and build a connection, you know. You know what I mean? You I love it. I love it. Come on. You just can't be like, I'm better than you. Hire me. Like, you know. I think it. You got to be on a, on a level with them. I don't think of myself. I'm proud of what we've accomplished. I'm proud that my people are doing well. But you're, you're but the same Richard Shulman from 2003 when you first started. You know what happens January 1st every year? What? Your numbers go back to zero. Oh, good point. <laughs> good point. Good point. And, and we all start back at zero sales for the year. And at KW, uh, I don't know why they do this. I can see all the numbers online, but I can't see last year's numbers online. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell how many sales you made in 2017. So. Right. Well, let's yeah. finish off with this. Now, again, I want you to think back. This is a, a reflection question. Yeah. What do you attribute your success to? I mean, you've, you're pretty damn successful. Yeah. I mean, you're the best of the best. That's fair. I'll, just, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll be unhumble about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but what do you attribute all that to? Think about I mean, there's like not one thing. I um, I hate that. Like, what's the one? I, I don't know. I don't say like, one. That's what do you? Oh, you just say to? one. I thought. I no, thought no, no, I no. What do you? What do you? You know? What do you think created Richard Shulman, man? I, I'll give you three things. I okay. think. I think one is you have to be a worker. You know. I just don't. There's no other way. It's like how I was raised, and I don't. I don't know any other way. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, I was in bed a couple months ago. I had my iPad. Someone texted me 11:30 at night wants to see a property. And most people wouldn't reply or they wouldn't have their phone on or they'd be, you know, they you know, wouldn't be getting messages on their iPad or something. And I started texting with the guy and I made an appointment to show him the property at seven thirty the next morning. And I don't think most agents would do that. Right. And it's not hard. I'm not saying why I'm, I you know, I have all this skill to do it. I'm just like this is my natural instinct. And the guy hired me, you know, to sell he wrote an offer on that condo and then hired me to sell his condo. And he hired me because he's like, I want a guy who's like answering his text messages at 11.30 at night. Well, let's call that work ethic. You've got a great work ethic. You've got to have a work ethic, right? There's no, there's no way around it. You can't be skilled enough to the point where you're not. You can't just disappear for, you know, those people who are like, I'm out of town for five days. I'll respond to messages when I get back. It's not going to work. What's number two? You got bored of that one? No, no, no. no that was good. I, I, wanted I think number two is that you have to have a, a goal in mind. You have to have like a really clear vision of what you want to do. This is a really hard business because let's say I do an open house today, I meet you at an open house today, I might sell you a house in three to six months, might be two years, might be never, but I've got to have enough faith and vision that I know that if I go out and meet enough people at today's open house, that eventually they're going to roll into business. And you get into a slow February and you want to quit, or you're like, oh, it's November 30th, no one's in the office, I'll just take off a few days. I mean, you've got to have a real vision about why you show up for the job every day. Um, and then number three is I, I'm really uh, grateful for the platform KW has given me. Uh, I think I would have done well no matter what because of the first two, but KW, the way that KW put training first and business running as what we do, like we, KW, the model is not you're a realtor, you're a realtor, you're a realtor. It's you run a small business that happens to sell real estate. And that's a really important distinction because it makes me treat my real estate like a business. Like I show up at 8.30 after I drop my kids off. I make my phone calls. I respond to my emails. Everything's done in a professional manner like a real business. And that platform, you know, also building a team and, you know, having, you know, content and training and environment where it's like, oh, you hire three assistants and you have a hierarchy of assistants and you have a coach who coaches your team because you're a real business. And you have salespeople and you have, a, you know, all these things like a real business and a real platform. It changes how your outlook is. I think otherwise I'd probably just be like, 
a guy with maybe a partner somewhere else, you know? Okay. Still doing fine, but like not to the same level of happiness. Anything you regret? That's a good one. I'm not like really like a regrets guy. Like, I wish I had joined KW earlier, but I mean, I basically joined KW when we were new here in LA. I don't really like look back with regret. Like, I just look at like opportunity to do better. Uh -huh. Yeah, like I wish I had embraced training earlier in my career. It took me a while to come around, but that's about it. Let me finish off with this last one, actually. Yeah. Uh, you said me, because it's important to me. Um, my kids are grown, man. I got, yeah. I, you know, I got a son who's 31. I think my youngest is 27. Um, how do you manage, because you have small children. Yeah. How do you balance that? How do you balance your children, a wife, yeah. family life? Um, I think you just have to, uh, I think one, you have to be really good at your calendar. So like, you know, I had, I do drop off every day. It's a habit, right? That's one thing. What a drop off? Uh, I drop off my kids at school oh, every it. morning. Okay. So that's a habit. Oh, that's cool. And I volunteer. So I was like, I did the computer lab today with my kindergartner. And that's just on the calendar. That's neat. You know, you call me and say, Richard, I, I want to see a home 9.30 on Thursday morning. I can't do it. I'm in computer lab. But I think the other half of that is you have to be really intentional. That when you show up for work, because you're constrained on time, when you show up for work, it's not like Facebook, the news, you know, chat at the coffee, you know. Oh, Rob, I hate, I hate when I see people like, walk to the coffee down the street, it drives me nuts, it drives me nuts. But they're, like, not, but they're not on the Richard Schulman team, what do you care? Some of them are. Oh, God. <laughs> it drives me nuts. I said they got free coffee here, and it's here. Right. Now, look, you need a break, you need a break. But I think like when you come to work, if you watch me work, it's like, you can do a time-lapse video. Like When I'm working, I'm on the phone, I'm doing my emails, I've got a list of things to do, i got my list up here, and I just grind through it. And I just know like today I need to be somewhere by 4, I need to be in the car out of here by 3.30. Like, Everything else, like everything has to be done by 3.30. Now some stuff I'll just, I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll put aside to do tonight. I usually like, will do some non-urgent tasks at night, but you have to be super intentional about what you're doing with your time. Best thing I learned in real estate was that we all, all we have to sell is our time, right? And that's all we're selling. We don't have a product. Our right. product is our service, our time. So right, right. I have to be super intentional about it to make all that work. That's neat. All right, listen, uh, you got a restaurant. It's, yeah. your, it's your daughter's birthday. How old is yeah. one of your daughters? Seven, five, She's and two. Seven, seven year old just turned seven. Yeah. You had a restaurant with her, and you guys got balloons. It's great. You got a cake yeah. there. Your phone rings. It's a client. What do you yeah. do? I just send it to voicemail. All right. But the nice part about a team is let's say I can see the voicemails. It says, oh, hey, I'm, I need to see this home. I want to buy a home. I want to sell a home. I just, if I'm unavailable, I just forward it to someone. My point is family comes first. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Listen, I want you to, if you can, just give us your contact information so those who want to yeah. possibly speak with you on the team thing, yeah. I still can't believe you're taking people on. Uh, yeah. That's great. Uh, we got a lot of viewers. If you can mention how they can contact you, that'd be fantastic. What do you Yeah. Uh, so my phone number is 482-0173, and uh, my email is shulmanrd at gmail.com. I'm sure you can, like, put that at the bottom. You can put it on the It's right here. If you can't find me, you do not deserve to be on the team. I'm out there. Yeah. I'm on. I'm everywhere. You can find me online. I just don't think people knew that you still brought people onto your team. I had no idea. I you thought you were like very selective, and I thought it well, was, we are very selective. I got you, but I thought it was like a golden group. Like, no, we'll let you know when we're opening. You know, some yeah. Positions. We're, you know, I used to be like that. And I learned a very important lesson. I forgot who told me this, but it was like basically like when you manage a team. Like my job is now, let's say, a third of my job is managing the team, or half the job is managing the team. I have to not, pro I'm not prospecting for buyers and sellers, I'm prospecting for people to be on the team. Because we always need more people. We always, you know, we're always at maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. There's never been a day where we've been like, we called all the people we have to call. We've contacted all of our clients and helped them with their needs today. Uh -huh. like, there's always more that we can do for them, and that's business we're leaving on the table. So all right, good. good. Good stuff, man. Appreciate your time. Yeah, anytime. Thanks, man. Go Dodgers. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching this last video. Hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. Hey, do us a favor. If you think a family member or a friend would also enjoy it, why don't you share it with them? I guarantee it they're going to get something out of it. In addition, if you have any comments, questions, or a topic you want us to discuss, hey, leave it down in the comment section. And one last thing. If you haven't subscribed yet, what the hell are you waiting for? Do it right now. Hope to see you next week.